against all the odds. Against all the odds, Christ is risen. And you see that on the banner. I hope it's in your heart that we come together to worship the risen Christ. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? We begin our worship on this Easter Sunday with a great hymn. I know you will sing to your hearts and lift your voices and maybe even raise your hands. You obviously remember my last sermon. <coughs> Jesus Christ is risen today.
Now you may be seated and I will lead you in prayers of confession and thanksgiving. But first, this is Easter Sunday. We, we will pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you for the message of Easter. The assurance that life is not in vain. That love has blotted us out. That love is not blotted out. And that faith is not futile. We praise you that death is not the end, but a new beginning. A gateway to heaven. Receive the worship we offer you this day in the light of your Easter triumph. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks to God for the life and witness of each one of you, for the offerings that you bring to this table, for the life that you lead, seeking to follow Jesus, the risen Christ. Lord, we give you thanks for each person and each gift and pray that you will use all for your honour and glory. O thou who are love eternal, this morning we praise you for the resurrection of Jesus. It was the power of your love that brought him back from the darkness of death against all the odds so that he might ascend into the light of your everlasting presence. In the person of Jesus you brought heaven down to earth. In him the eternal has entered the realm of the finite. In him that which had been unseen has become visible. He is the Lord of eternal salvation who emptied himself of glory that he might walk beside us in this journey here on earth. This risen Jesus is indeed our Saviour and Lord of all creation. Lord Jesus, this morning we have heard your words. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to life. We are aware that we are among those who have not seen nor touched your body and yet we are called to faith. Our sight now comes from the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit through which we find you in Scripture and taste your real presence when we meet around your table in the Lord's Supper. Forgive us when we live as if the witness of the Spirit is not enough to bring us to faith. Like Thomas, we have too often demanded physical proof of the resurrection. Like the disciples, we think that the report that he has risen must be idle chatter of confused women. Like so many, we fail to see you in the face of our neighbour. Deliver us when we blind ourselves to the eternal world of your kingdom, which surrounds us daily. Deliver us from a limited vision that believes reality is only found when we touch things or see things with the human eye. Lord, bring us to a greater awareness of the unseen realities that we can affirm those relationships with you and with one another in which we know and experience grace and forgiveness yet we never see nor touch. In our life of prayer and the pages of Holy Scripture where we hear your living presence calling to us and in the face of those who are rejected and scorned by this world's value system, and so we pray that you would encounter us this morning with your living presence in the words of Holy Scripture. We come, Lord, remembering how you taught us to pray together, saying, 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We remain seated as we sing together our next hymn, All Heaven Declares. taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she went, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated with Jesus his body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was a gardener, she said, Sir, 
If you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will take him. <coughs> Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabona, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his sides. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. The Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Jesus appears to Thomas. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Amen. To God add his blessing to his word. Please pray with me. Lord, as we come to this precious part of your word, I hope and pray that you would inspire us by your Holy Spirit and cause us to rejoice again with the songs that we have listened to just now. Hallelujah. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. So as I sat in my study and reflected on what to share with you this morning, I decided that I would try to be brief. Now you may smile, but that for me is quite a challenge. We all know that today is Easter Sunday. But for a lot of people, Easter is just another holiday. It's a three-day weekend of fun and no work. For some, it's nothing more than chocolate bunnies or Easter eggs, although both are very nice to have around. For others, it's just another ghost story that they don't believe. But we know better. You heard John read that precious passage of Scripture. For Christians, Easter means resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It means the promise of life after death. It means hope of a better life. It means joy. And today literally millions of people all over the world will be celebrating the resurrection 
of Jesus. Just to give you an example, before I came to church I watched for a few moments the service of a group of Christians in Ghana and I am wearing this from Ghana. They were overwhelmingly joyful and as you know Ghanaians can be very joyful. They can dance and sing unlike you and me more reserved. But I watched them and I thought to myself, you know, in 2015, 2017, 2019, I was with them, celebrating and sharing in the abundant joy that they had in their spirits as they worshipped the living Lord. That's going on all over the world. Millions of people celebrating the fact that 2,000 years ago on that Sunday morning our Lord Jesus was raised up and the tomb was empty. I love the picture that held ahead on the screen before we started worship of the empty tomb. Thank you for sharing that. You know, once there was a man who decided to start a new religion, but he was complaining that he could not make any new converts. He didn't know what to do, so he spoke with a friend, and the friend said, all you have to do is get yourself crucified, die, and rise again on the third day, and you'll have no problem. No other religion can celebrate Easter. If you are a Muslim, your leader Muhammad died in June the 8th, 632 AD at the age of 61. And millions of people go to his tomb, which his body still occupies to this day. All the leaders of these man-made religions have died. Only Jesus has defeated death. The resurrection is the basis of our faith. And if Christ did not rise from the dead, then we are just wasting our time here every Sunday. Not only that, but I would say that the Resurrection is the most important event in all of history. The words that you heard read, He is not here, but He is risen, changed the course of history. And they continue to do so. Let's take a look at why the Resurrection is so important to us. I would just want to pause for a moment and ask you, not out loud, but to say the words to yourself, I feel great. Just try it. Go on, just try it. Don't be shy. All your sins are forgiven. You're on your way to heaven. Jesus is alive and living in you. Now say it again, I feel great. A Sunday school teacher was explaining to a group of small children about the death and resurrection of Jesus. She made a crude cross out of some sticks and explained how Jesus was nailed to the cross. A little boy responded by saying, Oh, that's too bad. In the very next breath, however, the teacher told how Jesus rose from the grave, coming back to life. The little boy's eyes got so big, and he said, and you can imagine the little boy saying, Totally awesome! 
The resurrection of Jesus is totally awesome, although many people of the world don't know this, and many doubt it. The Apostle Paul wrote in his letters to the Corinthian church, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Preaching a dead Christ will not save anybody. If we preach about a Saviour who is not risen, then our preaching is empty. You know what that's like? It's like throwing a rope to a drowning man without having the one end of the rope anchored securely. A lady once wrote to a question and answer forum saying that their minister had told them that Jesus only swooned on the cross and the disciples only nursed him back to health. The answer came back. Beat your minister 39 strokes with a cat of nine tails. Nail him to a cross. Hang him in the sun for six hours. Run a spear through him. Put him in an airless tomb for 36 hours and then see what happens. You see, the Roman soldiers were experts at crucifixions. They had performed that procedure countless times. The centurion, you recall, gave testimony to Pilate that Jesus was dead. Jesus didn't swoon. He died and then he was raised up. And when I say he was raised up, my voice doesn't say it with a question. He got up. There is no dispute. He got up. And there were witnesses to that. Peter saw him. Mary saw him. <coughs> Two men on the road to Emmaus saw him. Various disciples saw him on five different occasions. And more than 500 people saw him at once. James saw him. We have proof. Muhammad didn't get up. Confucius didn't get up. Buddha didn't get up. Joseph Smith is dead. Jim Jones is dead. David Koresh is dead. But Jesus is alive. He got up. People often ask, why was the stone rolled away? Well, the stone was not rolled away for him to come out. I can guarantee you that because we found, as we heard in this reading this morning, in the accounts of his appearances, at one point you heard John read this. The disciples were in the upper room and the windows and the doors were closed and locked for fear of the Jews. And what happened? Jesus walked in. He didn't need a door. He didn't need a door and no wall could hold him out. No stone could hold him in. The stone wasn't rolled away for him to come out. The stone was rolled away so that we could look in and have our own view, our own visible view of the empty tomb. That, my friends, if you forget everything else I say to you this morning, the empty tomb is the greatest evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, cynics and critics have tried to explain it away, but they have been unable to do so. 
The empty tomb stands as evidence to all that Jesus is not dead. He is alive today. Five-year-old Jimmy was in the kitchen as his mother was making supper. She asked him to go to the pantry and get her a can of tomato soup. But he didn't want to go in alone. It's dark in there and I'm scared, she said, he said. She asked again and he still refused. But finally she said, it's okay. Jesus will be in there with you. So Jimmy walked hesitantly to the door and slowly opened it. He peeked inside and it was dark. And he started to leave when he had an idea. Jesus, if you're in there, would you hand me a can of tomato soup? If, he said, you're in there. The stone was rolled away and we can look inside the scary tomb to see if Jesus is there, but he's not. Christ is risen. He got up. What are the odds that you would forget where you buried a loved one? You see, some say it was the wrong tomb, but if it were the wrong tomb, the Pharisees and Sadducees who put Jesus to death would certainly have found the right tomb and roll the stone away and produce the dead and decaying body of Christ. But they couldn't do it because it was the right tomb and it was empty. All of the great religious leaders of history have lived and died and their bodies are buried today. Only Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Only Jesus Christ broke the bonds of death and was raised up. April the 28th, 1962 is a very important date to me because it happens to be Joy's birthday. This church has been here for 70 years Plus, that's why we celebrated that event. People are what give days and dates special meaning, and loving people means remembering them. Loving them means honouring them. There's another day that's very special to me, and I imagine to you. The first day of the week is special because that's the day when Jesus rose from the dead. Sunday should always remind us of our resurrected Saviour. It is not just any other day. We started our journey to this day back on Ash Wednesday. <sighs> Ashes are not our end. They are not our destiny. Because Jesus was crucified for our sins, because Jesus was raised up from the grave, death has been defeated. And yes, we are tempted to say, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. But we don't say that. We do not stay down because Easter, Easter, we're all raised up. And in the words of Handel, Hallelujah. Amen. So
So we're going to remain seated and in a quiet, meditative way, sing with these words, just as I am. today the faith in the future that you brought to so many both through your coming and through your resurrection from the dead. We remember how Mary and Joseph looked forward to the day of your birth, how the shepherds and magi caught their breath in wonder as they knelt before you, how the hearts of Anna and Simeon leapt in anticipation and how your disciples and the crowds flocked to hear you, gave thanks, convinced that you were the Messiah, the one God had promised, the long-awaited deliverer come to set them free. We remember how that vision of the future was shattered by events to follow, your pain, your humiliation, your suffering and death, hope ebbing away as the lifeblood seeped from your body, an end to their dreams, an end to everything. We remember how the news had spread that the tomb was empty, the stone had rolled away, your body was gone, and how, despite it all, your followers could scarcely bring themselves to hope, afraid to take the risk of faith 
in case they should face the heartache of losing him once more. But we remember finally how you appeared in all your risen glory in the garden, in the upstairs room, on the Emmaus Road, by the Sea of Galilee, and the dream was born again. The smouldering embers of faith were rekindled. Lord Jesus Christ, the world is waiting, it's hurting, it's longing, it is searching for hope, crying out for meaning, hungry for some reason to believe in the future. Come again in your living power and bring new life to all. Lord Jesus, where faith has died and dreams have faded, may hope flower again. For it is in your name that we pray. Amen. We close our service and sing together Thine be the glory, risen conquering Son, and we shall stand to sing.
So believe this and go in his grace and love and power. In the blessing of God Almighty Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with each one of you this day and forever.